Once upon a time, in 2007, I was in Lower Manhattan and I was walking home from my job that I could not stand. And as I was walking, I, could, I had shiny shoes on, but if you looked at the soles of my shoes, I had little holes and my socks were starting to war. And I, would, I remember going up into my apartment, and it's hard to call it my apartment because it was actually a little section of, a, of someone's, uh, someone's room that I found off of Craigslist. And I walked into my room like this because it was a shower curtain rod in order to get in. And needless to say, it was not the, the best existence at, at the time. It wasn't a highlight of my life. But one of the things that I did enjoy uh, every day, one of my reprieves, was to open up my laptop and go on to AIM Instant Messenger. Now, I don't know, some of you may or may not remember AIM, but one of my reprieves during this time was to uh, talk to my friends. That was very lonely because not a lot of people lived in Lower Manhattan. And on this one particular day, uh, a girl that I liked was on AIM. And we had been talking for the past few weeks to this girl. Uh, her and I went to college with each other. She played soccer and I played lacrosse. And while we were talking, she said, you know, I'm actually going up to New York City this weekend and I'm free Friday night. I said, that's great. So leaving me the inv invitation to ask her out to dinner, which she said yes. And even though I didn't have a lot of money, I didn't like my job and I couldn't really afford nice shoes, I decided to go to an expensive restaurant, Jules Live Jazz, which was in the East Village. And we were having a great time when the date actually ha ca uh, came, came about. And, you know, our, our chemistry was there we picked up pretty much right where we left off. And then the check came, and I gave my credit card, and the waitress came back, and she said, sorry, sir, but your card's been declined. It felt like she said, I'm sorry, sir, your card's been declined, and you are a loser. And she didn't say that, of course, but that's how I felt. Their tables were right by. I could feel embarrassment just flood through my body. My face turned red. I started to sweat. I said, uh... You know, the thing about that card is, I, I just, um, I just, it's a new card. I'm actually really successful. You know, I have an ATM, a uh, cash. I'll, I'll go. I'll be right back. Bye. <sighs> oh, my God. I remember walking out of that restaurant, heart pounding. Please have money. Please have money. I walked furiously to the ATM machine as I could feel my socks going through the soles of my shoes. I finally got up to that ATM machine. I walked up to it like it was, uh, like it was Zoltar in the movie Big. And if you're under 30, you probably won't understand that reference. But I got, put my, my card in, I pulled it out, long pause, please have money, please have money. I started to hear that beautiful sound. Yes, I had money, thank God. I grabbed the cash, paid for the date, the night was over. Now, that story, it ends up being happy. I would marry that, that woman. We do have two kids, she's here today. So that all worked out. But I remember that night, walking back into my apartment, opening up the curtain rod and putting my head in the pillow and I wanted to bury myself. I remember thinking to myself, man, what the hell happened? I used to love my life. I was captain of a division one sports team. And now I hate my job. I don't make any money. I don't even have shoes that actually work. What happened? I couldn't pinpoint it in that moment where I went wrong, but years later, as a CEO and a founder of a software company that actually helps elite athletes with their professional development and life skills, I can tell you what the problem was. The problem was passion. I didn't replace my passion for being a college athlete with what my next passion was going to be. And the thing about passion is you either have it or you don't. You can have it and then you can lose it. And the thing that's really interesting about an athlete's passion is that it's always, partner, it's always coupled with a pursuit. You have a passion to play, you have a pursuit to win. You have a passion to play, you have a pursuit to make the playoffs. A passion to play, a pursuit to make a championship season. Pushing through little individual goals to get to an end goal. Psychologist Angela Duckworth defines that as grit. And in her book that she authored, titled Grit, she says the number one uh, indicator of who will be successful, successful is what level of grit they have. <sighs> I 
The other thing about passion, when you think about a college athlete or a professional athlete, is that there is always an expiration date. They, they, their sport will end. There will come a day when it's over. How are they going to handle that? You know, in my line of work, um, I'm sorry, when, I, when, I, when you talk to anybody that works with athletes, when they focus on the, uh, whether it's on their development or if, if it's a, an employer who exclusively likes to hire athletes, they will tell you athletes have transferable skills. Athletes know how uh, to manage a busy schedule. They're conditioned to manage, they're conditioned to navigate team dynamics. They're conditioned to push past their perceived limits on a daily basis. Athletes have vision. They are visionaries. Matter of fact, my company gave a career discovery assessment to 770 athletes. And in that assessment, we found that 69% of athletes had visionary as their number one trait. This assessment ranked their traits from zero or one to or weakest to strongest. So 50 or 69% of athletes had visionary as their number one trait. Athletes are visionaries. You, it makes sense. You have to visualize yourself playing optimally to win. You have to visualize yourself as a high school athlete to make it at the college level. Only 7% do. 2% play at the division one level. The problem is, for elite athletes, especially college athletes, in a time when we're not in COVID, is that in-season athletes spend 80 hours a week between school and sports. They're like racehorses, man. They've got blinders on and they're focused on what they have to accomplish every day, every week to get to that goal, to that pursuit. It doesn't leave a lot of time to think about what you're going to do and how you're going to replace that passion. You see what is in front of you, coaches. Maybe I'll be a coach, athletic administrator. Maybe I'll be an athletic administrator. What are my parents doing, older siblings? These tend to be the op options that they gravitate towards. Now, like you, my days are filled with a lot of Zoom calls post-COVID. And my, calls are, my Zoom calls are either with employers who want to hire athletes or get their information about their programs to athletes, or it's with course creators who want to gamify their message, or, if it's, or it's with influencers who want to get their message in front of athletes, public speakers that want to get their message in front of athletes in a gamified fashion. But I also speak to a lot of athletic administrators. And a few weeks ago, I had a conversation that was very typical of the type of conversations I have with athletic administrators. I got on the phone with this in individual. She was a, a young athletic administrator, just two years out of school herself. And she, when, I, when I, we got on the phone, I asked her, what do you do? And she said, I work in career development and life skills. That's great. And that's a, a role that sits in most athletic departments, somebody to help the athlete with their internships and jobs and, and figure out how not to go into debt and so forth and all the life skills you'll need when you graduate. And I asked, how many um, athletes do you have in your athletic program? And she said, 472. I said, whoa, that's a lot. And how many other athletic administrators help you with the career development and life skills? And she said, oh, no, no, it's just me. And I said, wow. Now, of course, I would never say this, but I was thinking, are, are we putting those athletes from that school in the best position? One of my competitors did a survey with 200 athletic departments. And they asked in, in the survey, one of the questions was, are you tracking job placement after graduation? 82% said they are not. You know, here we have, it, the NCAA is producing roughly 200,000 athletes, full of grit, full of transferable skills, but we don't know where we're transferring those skills. And we live in a time when we have problems in society and we need our best people in front of those problems. See, the thing about problems, the thing about issues is that they're always accompanied with jobs and internships, opportunities, apprenticeships. We need these athletes that are high grit to see that. You know, when you are a college athlete, the athletic department will generally give you the best, the best of everything so you can win. They'll give you the best gear. They'll give you the best coaches, the best personal trainers, the best tutors so you have a high GPA so that you can be on the field. Are we giving them the best to win after the game? 
I question that. Those are the questions that I ask. The thing about being an athlete is that you're used to being measured. It's kind of part of the gig. How fast can you run? How much can you lift? What's your GPA? How much do you weigh? Drummond, stop eating so much cheese. That's what my coach used to tell me by the time when I was getting the end, I was starting to put in the LBs. We're used to getting measured. Why are we not measuring the frequency of career exploration? Why? Why are we not measuring how frequently an athlete is looking for the next passion that they're going to replace when the game is over? You know, during COVID, I spent a lot of time, probably like you guys, watching a lot of YouTube. And I remember watching an interview with comedian Kevin Hart. And he was on the Joe Rogan experience. And he said to Joe, he said, you know, Joe, I'm successful. I have reached a level of success. I know the uh, pitfalls, the challenges of what you got to do to get to success. I'm just going to share that information. I'm going to share it so that somebody behind me who wants to follow in my footsteps can take my work and go further. And those who know Kevin Hart, he's not just a stand-up comedian. He's not just an actor. He knows broadcasting and producing. He has partnerships with J.P. Morgan Chase on advancing black leaders. He's passionate about financial literacy. See, the thing about passion is it's contagious. It's contagious. So if you're lucky enough to be passionate about what you do, you represent the minority. Gallup polls say that only 80 or 85 percent of people don't like what they do. 15 percent, you represent that 15 percent. If you're passionate, share. Share what you do. Share your position. Share how you got there. Share the opportunities. This is a world that I'm looking to create. And I'm looking to bring in partners. I visualize and I dream about a time where athletic departments and the NCAA look at career exploration as a measurable uh, item that they must track in order for the athletes to get on the field, just like they do with GPA. And if we can couple and marry that concept with bringing people that are passionate about what they do to share, to share their position like a lighthouse, and we bring those two concepts together, then we can take the collective psychology that our athletes, and we can turn that into our greatest resource. Thank you.